Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm Cecily Marcus. I'm the curator of the Upper Midwest Literary Archives here at the University of Minnesota Libraries. On behalf of the libraries, we want to thank all of you for coming tonight to celebrate the publication of Robert Bly's newest book of selected poems, a really excellent title, Stealing Sugar from the Castle. The Upper Midwest Literary Archives are very happy to host this evening of poetry, and we also want to thank our fellow sponsors for their contributions. Literary Witnesses of Plymouth Congregational Church, the Loft Literary Center, Rain Taxi Review of Books, and the Friends of the University of Minnesota Libraries for sponsoring the reception that will follow tonight's program, to which we hope all of you will come. The Upper Midwest Literary Archives, right across the way in Anderson Library, is the home of Robert Bly's papers, as well as those of many of our most beloved authors and literary presses. John Berryman, James Wright, Patricia Hampel, Lewis Hyde, Grey Wolf Press, Milkweed Editions. Open to the public, these collections give us a lasting understanding of the lives, ideas, words and works that fill our bookshelves, our brains, and our bedside tables. The archives of Michael Dennis Brown, also part of the literary archives at the University of Minnesota, are no exception. Michael Dennis Brown is a prolific poet and librettist, a passionate teacher and loyal friend. As author of more than 12 books, including Things I Can't Tell You, also a really good title, Winner of numerous awards, two Minnesota Book Awards for Poetry and, the Nas and a National Endowment of Arts Fellowship, an Emeritus Pre Professor of English at the University of Minnesota where he was a teacher for over 39 years, Michael Dennis Brown's career as a poet and writer continues ever forward. Please join me in welcoming Michael Dennis Brown. As my Irish auntie would say, it's nice to be with ya. <laughs> April the 16th, 1966, was the first time I heard Robert Reed. Several of us had driven up from Iowa City for the event. It was at the University of Chicago, a reading organized by poets against the Vietnam War. And James Wright was one of the readers also. I think it's important for writers of new generations to remember the energy of the protest movement back in those times, the courage and imagination it took, and to remain inspired by it in these days. Robert was, thank you. Robert was 39 years old then and wonderfully fierce in manner. This was a poet who could write a line such as, a green parrot shudders under the fingernails and mean it. <laughs> I think it's also important to remember how Robert in 1968 at Lincoln Center handed over his National Book Award for the light around the body to the resistance movement. At the podium he said, I'm speaking for many, many Americans when I ask this question. Since we are murdering a culture in Vietnam at least as fine as our own, do we have the right to, to congratulate ourselves on our cultural magnificence? The year after Chicago, 1967, several of us drove up from Iowa City to hear another anti-war reading this time at the Mayo Auditorium here on campus. After the, the, the reading, I remember a party at Seven Corners, just a couple of blocks from here, and most especially, turning up the next morning at the Gopher Campus Motor Lodge, where Robert was staying, and joining several other writers in jump-starting Robert's Blue Plymouth. <laughs> Huffing and puffing down 10th Street, until it finally fired up and Robert was back off down to Madison under his own power. Bill Booth, a mutual friend up north, once said, someone should write something about Robert's cars. 
I moved to Minnesota in 1971 and have known Robert on and off since then. There have been years I saw very little of him and I've never made it to a great mother conference or drummed, but I I've always recognized in him an exceptional spirit. Loved him for his radical stance in the world and in his poems. His curiosity, his continual formal discoveries, his emotional directness, his wild mind, his genius for the image, his ability simply to be memorable in his phrasing. And for what I would call, both in his writing and in his translations, the magical colloquial music he makes, which is very much based on rhythmical human speech. He's always had the capacity to astonish, poem after poem in which the many layers of his imagining flash at us. Sometimes it seems like the swaying and weaving of the aurora borealis, charged poetic particles streaming from some massive cerebral event. But here with us upon the page, but here with us upon the page, Robert Borealis, I might perhaps call him. Call him. This is the kind of thing you write when you do a written introduction. I, could, I, could, I, could I take a little bit of that back? Robert is a generous man. Over the years, he visited my workshops a number of times, most often for small pay or no pay at all, and always managed to stir things up. He told us once of saying of a certain student poem that it was about as exciting as saying, I almost went to Hawaii once. Things were never less than lively. So thanks to you, Robert, on behalf of all those former students for your willingness to make those visits and to be as frank and as provocative and sometimes outrageous as you were. D.H. Lawrence, in his magnificent essay on Walt Whitman in Studies in Classical American Literature, says, Whitman has meant so much to me. Whitman, the one man breaking the way ahead. He describes Whitman as a pioneer and calls him the white aborigine. And Robert, the pioneer, has meant so much to me, to so many of us. I used to tell my students that writing should be daring. And if Robert's writing is anything, it is that. He takes risks, sometimes huge ones, unbelievable leaps, and he does not use a safety net. Allen Ginsberg, in his great prose poem, A Supermarket in California, imagines seeing Whitman in the aisles of the supermarket and addresses him directly at the end of the poem, calling him lonely old courage teacher. teacher. I associate Robert with a certain loneliness, and I associate him with courage all through his long career. Seeing this sumptuous new book, a selection of poems written between 1950 and 2013, I think of what Whitman wrote, who touches this book, touches a man. And by courage, I think of an insistence on speaking your heart and mind, speaking from the deepest and sometimes disowned parts of yourself, and also of persistence in hard times when you feel overwhelmed, either by public opposition or public indifference, or by voices inside that insist you should perhaps think of trying something else, some honest profession, anything other than writing. Generous in his imagination and his gestures, he has championed so many writers in Minnesota, some of you I can see here tonight, and also across the nation and the world. And I think it's fair to say that he saved James Wright's life when that great poet struggled so much here in Minneapolis. And I remember a reading he gave in St. Paul after William Stafford had died. Robert had edited a selected poems, and at the end of his reading of Bill's poems, Robert asked us all to imagine that the spirit of William Stafford was standing just outside to the west of the building we were in. And he asked us all to turn in that direction where there were large windows, extend our arms and our hands, and hold them up toward Bill. 
We all did that and stayed in such a pose for perhaps two minutes in silence. I call Robert generous, but his generosity is not unlimited. I remember one occasion quite some years ago up in the North Woods when I stopped over at Cry of the Loon Lodge with my friend Stephen Paulus and his wife Patty, who were visiting for the weekend at our cabin about five miles away. Cry of the Loon was a resort belonging to our friends Bill and Nancy Booth. Robert happened to be visiting too from his cabin on the other side of Lake Cabacona. The conversation turned to generosity, to the example set by the life of St. Francis of Assisi, a very rich young man who gave up all he had to become poor and identify with the causes of the poor. Robert went on for quite a while about the great saint. I saw my chance and began to admire Robert's shirt, a dark blue button-down J.C. Penny shirt of no great distinction, but a sturdy shirt nevertheless. <laughs> Robert unbuttoned the shirt and gave it to me. <clears throat> Stephen, a quick study, expressed admiration for Robert's belt. <laughs> and the belt came off. <laughs> Stephen and I then steered our attention to Robert's pants. But it was not to be. <laughs> I could go on and on, but I know I mustn't. But I can't not say something about all the poems he has brought to our attention in addition to his own. His translations, gathered together recently in The Winged Energy of Delight. Where would we be without his Rumi, his Kabir, his Jakobsen, his Neruda, his Jimenez, his Machado, his Mirabai, his Transtromer, or his marvelous little book, The Eight Stages of Translation, or all the poets to be found in The Soul is Here for Its Own Joy, one of the great anthologies of sacred writing. He has worked so tirelessly over the years to bring into American English writers without whom our imaginations would be poorer, paler. So much of what he has done occurs to me in my life. To take one single example, in moments of self-absorbed distress, these lines often come to me. It's Robert's version of the Ojibwe, taken from the translation by Francis Densmore. Sometimes I go about pitying myself, and all the time I'm being carried on great winds across the sky. In so many ways, his own words and the words of other writers he has honored keep us company. They are woven into our lives. But finally, this book, Stealing Sugar from the Castle, his third selected and new poems. Tonight we celebrate this harvesting, this treasure. A couple of years ago at lunch, Robert, who had been rather quiet, suddenly turned to me and said, so what have you learned the past 20 years? Can you imagine? <laughs> I stammered out some sort of answer. But this book of Roberts reveals many of the things he has learned over more than 60 years of strenuous imagining. It does what we want the best writing to do. It takes the measure of things. It makes strange what we might have thought was familiar. And we realize, exhilarated, how large our own lives can be if we stay similarly committed to our own curiosity, keep up our courage and our hope, never stop seeking. So, Mr. Page, bravo, please welcome our own Robert Bly. Look at that, some bunch of intelligent looking people out there. <laughs>
course, looks can be deceiving. <laughs> anyway, it's very sweet to see you all. What are you doing here? I'm uh, doing your mic stand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, what do I do? Look in the phone. See if I can find it. What if I didn't write it? I got these broken up into groups of two. <laughs> the moon, after writing poems all day, I go off to see the moon in the pines. Far in the woods, I sit down against a, against a game, not against a pine. <laughs> the moon has her porches turned to face the light but the deep part of her house is in darkness. Oh, very deep. Yeah. <laughs> Page 13. <laughs> Poem in three parts. I used up the title first time I, you know, tried it. We used up the title. Oh, in an early morning, I think I shall live forever. I am wrapped in my joyful flesh as the grass is wrapped in its clouds of green. Rising from a bed where I dreamt of long rides past castles and hot coals, the sun lies happily on my knees. I have suffered and survived the night bathed in dark water like any blade of grass. I think I was, I was thinking about the years in New York in which I'd be walking along street looking for a dime. I have suffered and survived the night. Bathed in dark water, like any blade of grass. The strong leaves of the box elder trees plunging in the wind call us to disappear into the wilds of the universe, where we shall sit at the foot of a plant and live forever like the dust. All right, yeah. <laughs> All right. Who, who picked that? That was good. This one, night, you want? <clears throat> if I think of a horse wandering about sleeplessly all night on this short grass covered with moonlight, I feel a joy. As if I had thought of a pirate ship plowing to dark flowers. The box elders around us are full of joy, obeying what is beneath them. The lilacs are sleeping, and the plants are sleeping. Even the wood made into a casket is asleep. The butterfly is carrying loam on its wings, and the toad is bearing tiny bits of granite in his skin. The leaves at the crown of the tree are asleep like the dark bits of earth at its root. Alive. We are like a black, uh, sleek water beetle skating across water in any direction we wish and soon to be swallowed suddenly from beneath. <laughs> uh, that's scary. <laughs> What's happening? Oh, I thought you were waving to your girlfriend. Or all right. <laughs> what am I doing? Night. Now I'm doing the raft of green logs. Oh, man. Let's see. Two sixty. Poetry is an occupation fit for slaughterers and knife wielders. Life on earth needs many kills to engender the soft leaps of the cheetah. God may be tender, but writing poetry with its whole herd of images that have to be saved or slaughtered has made me fierce. Mm -hmm. The Lord of this world condemns 
half his friends to death. Music testifies to that. Notes wave their arms and sink into the cold Atlantic. During the years I called to Rilke and Bema, Jakob Bema, I hung on to small branches. I ran over the waterfall, still holding the twig of reason. It's all right if we tumble down the falls. I remember how many lambs died in the farm. Our desires reformed themselves overnight. Anyway, my affections were stuffed into the giant's mouth. Some marriages are rafts. I saw water between the green logs. Ah, you could not have saved me. I don't know what that means at the end there. <laughs> I don't see anybody offered to save me. All right, now what do you want? Talking into the ear of a donkey. Talking into the ear of a donkey. I have been talking into the ear of a donkey, and I have so much to say. <laughs> and the donkey can't wait to feel my breath stirring the immense oats of his ears. <laughs> ah, what has happened to the spring, I cry, and our legs that were so playful in the bobblings of April. Oh, never mind about all that. The donkey says, just take hold of my mane so you can lift your lips closer to my hairy ears. <laughs> Conversation with the mouse. One day a mouse called to me from its curly nest. How, how do you sleep? I love curliness. I said, well, I like to be stretched out. I mean, I like the bones to be all lined up. I like to see my toes way off over there. I suppose that's one way, he said, but I don't like it. <laughs> the plantas don't act that way, nor the Milky Way. Well, what could I say? You know, you're near the end of the century when a sleepy mouse brings up the Milky Way. <laughs> <laughs> When my dead father called. <clears throat> Last night I dreamt my father called to us. He was stuck somewhere. It took us a long time to dress. I don't know why. The night was snowy, there were long black roads. Finally, we reached the little town, Bellingham. There he stood by a street lamp in cold wind, snow blowing along the sidewalk. I noticed the uncertain sort of men, or uncertain sort of shoes that men wore in the early 40s and overalls. He was smoking. Why did it take us so long to get going? Perhaps he left us somewhere once. Or did I simply forget he was alone in winter, in some town. All right. Well, it's nice to give a reading and have someone else pick out the poems. <laughs> I don't think that's true. <laughs> what, what isn't true? I think you picked them out. Did I really? <laughs> Amazing. Well, that's good. That's why. My memory's so bad every time I read one of my own poems, I think I've never read that before. <laughs> it's called Things to Think. Think in ways you've never thought before. If the phone rings, think of it as carrying a message larger than anything you've ever heard, vaster than a hundred lines of Yeats. Think that someone may bring a bear to your door, may be wounded or deranged, or think that a moose has risen out of the lake and you're carrying on his antlers a child of your own whom you've never seen. 
when someone knocks on the door, think that he's about to give you something large. Tell you you're forgiven. Or that it's not necessary to work all the time. Or that it's been decided if you lie down, no one will die. Well, yeah. I don't know why I keep on working so much then. <laughs> Things to think when the cats. Did you make these up, this noise? Did I really? One day when the cat stole the milk. Well, there it is. There's nothing to do. The cat steals the milk and it's gone. Then the cat steals you. And you're found days later with milk on your face. <laughs> and that implies that you become whatever steals you. The tree steal a man and an old birch becomes his wife and they live together in the woods. None of us have... Some of us have always wanted God to steal us. Then our friends would call each other and print posters and we would never be found. I don't know what the hell that means. I can't steal the milk. Where are we now? Okay. 194. Resemblance between your life and a dog. <clears throat> Resemblance between your life and a dog. We could all write a poem on that, couldn't we? Homeless dog. Dog that ends up reading poems in the big auditorium. <laughs> I never intended to have this life, believe me. It just happened. You know how dogs turn up at a farm and they wag but can't explain. It's good if you can accept your life. You'll notice your faces become deranged trying to adjust to it. Your face thought your life would look like your bedroom mirror when you were 10. That was a clear river, untouched by a mountain wind. Even your parents can't believe how much you changed. Sparrows in winter, if you've ever held one, all feathers burst out of your hand with a fiery glee. You see them later in hedges. Teachers praise you, but you can't quite get back to the winter sparrow. Ah, your life is a dog. It's been hungry for miles. Doesn't particularly like you, but grows up and gives up and comes in. <laughs> Very weird. All right, now visiting my father, huh? What? Uh, can you all hear in the back? Is, that, is the sound okay? No, okay. What's the matter with it? Not close enough? Uh. <laughs> That's right, don't, don't worry about me. <laughs> we got to get a little closer. All right. <laughs> All right. Ah, is this it? Visiting my father. <coughs> Your chest, hospital gown awry, looks girlish today. It is your bluish reptile neck that is known whether I said to you, are you ready to die? I am, he said, it's too boring around here. He has in place, he has in mind some other place less boring. Uh, he's not ready to go, the doctor said. There must have been a fire that nearly blew out or a large soul inadequately feathered that became cold and angered. Some four-year-old boy in you, chilled by your mother, misprized by your father, said, I will defy. I will win anyway. I will show them. 
when Alice's well-off sister offered to take your boys during the Depression. Alice was his wife. When Alice's well-off sister offered to take your two boys during the Depression. You said it again. Now you bring that defiant mood to death. The four-year-old old boy in you does as he likes. He likes to stay alive. Through him you get revenge, persist, endure, overlive, overwhelm, get on top. You gave me this, and I do not refuse it. I am sitting in front of about 150 people. <laughs> it's in me. <laughs> All right. Now what? Part three. Part three. Your hard breathing, <clears throat> we all three noticed. <clears throat> to continue to live here, one must take air. But taking air commits you to sharing it with the puma and the eagle. When breathing stops, you will be free of that company. You came from the water world and do not wish to change again. My mother does not remember the water world. Nieces are here in this world, nephews, classmates, a son. But you sit with pointed, with puzzled eyes, as if to say, where is that reckless man who laughed and made me laugh? Is it this man with gaunt cheeks on the bed? All those times I drove to town carefully, overpacked snow. Is this what it comes to? Yes, it is. My dear mother, the tablecloths you saved are all gone. The baked corn dish you made for your boys, the Christmas Eve's opening perfume, always evening in Paris. <laughs> From your husband, the hope that a man would show his habits, give up his habits for you. They're all gone. The nurse takes my father for his bath. You and I wait here for Jacob to come back. What sort of flowers are those? Daisies, I say. A few minutes later, you ask again, what can I do but feel the invisible river go through me and sit here with you? All right. Mm. Now, where are we? Page 180. Shocks. There you go. And this is, I don't know how many of you have ever <clears throat> used pitchforks and, and, and took shocks apart and threw them on the rest of the machine. How many of you have ever used forks? In here, uh, there's a few. Uh, more in this side. The fox said that winter was coming. Each stood there said, I've given myself away. Take me. It's time. And we did. With the shiny tips of our forks, their handles so healthy and elegant, we slipped each bundle free and gave it to the load. Each bundle was like a soul tucked back into the cloud of souls. Well, that's how it'll be after death. Such an abundance of souls. All together, never tired, in the heavy wagon, in the heavy wagon. All right. Better than a kick in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> 69. 69? 169. We're looking for gratitude to our teachers. And there we go. Right. Yeah, and this is I was up at Cavacona Lake and frozen in the middle of winter. And um, 
I decided to write this poem and I had to find a piece of paper. I don't know what happened. What when we stride or stroll across the frozen lake, we place our feet where they have never been. We walked upon the unwalked, but we are uneasy. Who is down there but our old teachers? Water that once could take no human weight, we were students then, holds up our feet. And goes on ahead of us for a mile, beneath us, the teachers, and around us, the stillness. I don't think teachers get enough credit. Beneath us, the teachers. Imagine spending your life talking to idiots like us. <laughs> That's real devotion, you know. Beneath us, the teachers, and around us, the stillness. Oh, I know, where are we? Mm -hmm. Two old teachers. Late Abraham, 235. Mm -hmm. Oh, dear. Do you remember the night Abraham first saw the stars? He cried to Saturn, You are my Lord. How oh, happy he was. When he saw the dawn star, he cried, You are my Lord. How destroyed he was when he watched them set. Friends, he is like us. We take as our Lord the stars that go down. We are faithful companions to the unfaithful stars. We are diggers like badgers. We love to, to see the earth, dirt flying out from behind our back claws. And no one convince us that mud is not beautiful. It is our badger soul that thinks so. We are ready to spend the rest of our life walking with muddy shoes in the wet fields. We resemble exiles in the company, in the kingdom of the serpent. We stand in the onion fields looking up at the night. My heart is a calm potato by day and a weeping abandoned woman by night. Friend, tell me what to do since I'm a man in love with the setting stars. I'll read the last stanza again. My heart is a calm potato by day and a weeping abandoned woman by night. There you go, Robert, bragging again. My heart is a calm potato by day and a weeping abandoned woman by night. Friend, tell me what to do since I am a man in love with the setting stars. Mm -hmm. All right, how are we doing here? Mm -hmm. Getting sick of this. We want one source of bad information on page 200. 200? Mm -hmm. Don't put them in right order. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this man made up this reading. Isn't that lovely? Something to do for your friend. One source of bad information. There's a boy in you about three years old who hasn't learned a thing for 30,000 years. <laughs> Sometimes it's a girl. This child had to make up its mind how to save you from death. So he said things like, stay home. Avoid elevators. Eat only elk. <laughs> so you live with this child, but you don't know it. I mean, you're in the office, yes, but you live with this boy at night. And he's uninformed, but he does want to save your life. And he has. Because of this boy, you survived a lot. He's got six big ideas. Five don't work. Right now, he's repeating them to you. <laughs> that sounds like life, Arne. Where are we? I know it's 253. Are you doing okay out there? 
Yeah. So this is a um, this is an old um, Islamic story about a peat seam. Let's tell the story about Peat Seam and his horse. When the one he loved moved to the mountains, he bought a mare and a saddle and he started out. He rode all day with fire coming out of his ears and all night. When the rains fell, the mare knew it right away and she turned and headed straight for the barn. No one had told Pete Seam, but his horse had left a new foal back there in the stable. She thought of nothing all day but his sweet face with its long nose. Pete Seam, Pete Seam, how much time you've lost. Ah, he put the mountain between the mare's ears again. He slapped his own face. He was a good lover. And every night he fell asleep once more. Ah, friends, our desire to reach our true wife is great, but the mare's love for her child is also great. Please understand this. The journey was a three-day trip, but it took Pete Seam 30 years. You and I have been riding for years, but we're still only one day from home. I read the last stanza again, that's a deep one. <laughs> the mayor's love for her child is also great. Please understand this. The journey was a three day trip, but it took Pete Seam 30 years. You and I have been riding for years, but we're still only one day from home. Okay. Bitter, bitter, bitter. Two seventy four. Two seventy seventy four. Yes. Would you like some water? I've been keeping this. <laughs> I don't know. We forgot about it. I guess. Mm -hmm. Oh well. It's sort of fun to sit and read poems. Isn't it? Isn't it fun to listen to them? Yeah. You never know when a good one might come along. In the meantime, you have to be satisfied with good words. What are we doing? Listening. The goose cries and there's no way to save her. So many cheeps come from the nest by the river. If God doesn't listen, why are we listening? Very deep water covers most of the globe. Whenever I think of it, I think of it, I think of St. John. There is no remedy for deep water but listening. The king and queen already know about love. They search for each other through the whole deck. While we play our hands, they are listening. The day we die, we leech me like the fish abruptly jerked out of the water for him. It's the end of all listening. The day we die will each be like the fish abruptly jerked out of the water. For him, it's the end of all listening. Like thousands of others, I'm eating beet soup in some Russian inn. People write letters to me from heaven, but I'm not listening. The hermit said, because the world is mad, the only way through the world is to learn the arts and double the madness. Are you listening? The hermit said, because the world is mad, the only way through the world is to learn the arts and double the madness. <laughs> Are you listening? <laughs> I should have put that and eh, there. <laughs> Are you tired of these listening to the poems now? No. <laughs> Better not say yes. <laughs> mm. 
There are people who don't want Kierkegaard to be a humpback. It's funny thing of Kierkegaard is a humpback. But some people don't like reality. There are people who don't want Kierkegaard to be a humpback and they're looking for a wife for Suzanne. It's hard for them to say, so be it, amen. It's hard for them to say, so be it, amen. When the disciples found a dead dog in the road, they held their noses. This is from an old version of the New Testament. When the disciples found a dead dog in the road, they held their noses. Jesus walked over and said, what beautiful teeth. And so it's a way to say amen. If a young boy leaps over seven hurdles in a row, and an instant later, is an old man reaching for his cane. To the swiftness of it all, we have to say what? Amen. We always want to intervene when we hear that the badger is marrying the wrong person. But the best thing to say at a wedding is, come on, come on. The grapes of our ruin were planted centuries ago before Kedmon ever praised the Milky Way. Praise God. Damn God. All synonyms for Amen. Women in Crete loved the young men, but when the son of the deep waters, as he was called, dies in the bath, and they show the rose-colored water, Mary says, Amen. I don't understand that. Women in Crete loved the young men, but when the son of the deep waters dies in the bath, apparently a ritual, and they show the rose-colored water, Mary says, Amen. Keeping a small boat. It's so good of him to do this, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's so lovely to just sit here. And it's an honor, Robert. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it is. Look at these loony faces out there. It's an honor, too. <laughs> Why aren't they home listening to TV? I don't know. <laughs> Must be demented, don't you think so? <laughs> Ruined by teachers. <laughs> So many blessings have been given to us during the first distribution of light that we are admired in a thousand galaxies for our grief. Well, it's possible. You know, they're possible that there are whole planets in which no one grieves. It's not this one. So many blessings have been given to us during the first distribution of light that we are admired in a thousand galaxies for our grief. Don't expect us to appreciate creation or to uh, avoid mistakes. Each of us is a latecomer to the earth, picking up wood for the fire. Every night another beam of light slips out from the oyster's closed eye. I like that. Every night another beam of light slips out from the oyster's closed eye. So don't give up hope that the door of mercy may still be open. So don't give up hope that the door of mercy may still be open. Seth and Shem tell me, are you still grieving over the spark of light that descended with no defender near into the Egypt of Mary's womb? Seth and Shem tell me, are you still grieving over the spark of light that descended with no defender near into the Egypt? of Mary's womb. It's hard to grasp how much generosity is involved in letting us go on breathing. I often think of that. It's amazing. Someone is inattentive or something going on. So much generosity is, is involved in letting us go on breathing 
when we contribute nothing valuable but our grief. Mm. I didn't used to think that way. I used to think that what we had to give was a lot of happiness and, and good feelings and let's go to town and buy some beer. It's hard to grasp how much gener generosity is involved in letting us go on breathing when we contribute nothing valuable but our grief. Each of us deserves to be forgiven. If only for our persistence in keeping our small boat afloat when so many have gone down in the storm. This is the older, you, when you get to be my age, you, you notice that, how many you, people you've known have gone down in the storm. Each of us deserves to be forgiven. If only for our persistence in keeping our small boat afloat when so many have gone down in the storm. Okay, well that's about the wisdom for tonight. Is that it? Okay. Ah, three more pages. <laughs> no. Uh, three fifty. Three from page three fifty one. What? Um, the one on page three fifty one. Right there. Oh, I'm just not done with this yeah, page. That's right. Three fifty one. Okay. That's right. Aren't we lucky just to be able to sit here and read poems and listen to poems? Don't you think so? Yeah. Each of us deserves to be put into prison and they didn't notice it. <laughs> All right, what are we doing here at 351? What did we see today? What did we see today? Some days we are passive, listening to the incoming waves. And other days, we are like a light that sweeps out over the husky soybean fields all night. I'll do each stanza twice for kicks, see if you notice any difference, if it's any better. Some days we are passive, listening to the incoming waves. And other days, we are like a light that sweeps out over the husky soybean fields all night. What did we see today? Horses at the end of their tethering ropes, the wing of affection going over, flying bulls glimpsed passing the moon disk. What did we see today? Horses at the end of their tethering ropes, the wing of affection going over, flying bulls glimpsed passing the moon disk. Rather than arguing about whether Giordano Bruno was right or not, it might be better to fall silent and lose ourselves in the curved energy. Rather than arguing about whether Giordano Bruno was right or not, it might be better to fall silent and lose ourselves in the curved energy. We know how many men live alone in their 20s, how many women are married to the wrong person, how many fathers and sons are strangers to each other. We know how many men live alone in their 20s and how many women are married to the wrong person and how many fathers and sons are strangers to each other. It's all right if we keep forgetting the way home. It's all right if we don't remember when we were born. It's all right if we write the same poem over and over. It's all right if we keep forgetting the way home. It's all right if we don't remember when we were born. It's all right if we write the same poem over and over. Robert, I don't know why you talk so confidently about yourself in this way. There are a lot of shady characters in this town, and you are one of them. <laughs> That's from the old tradition from the gazelle in which you go through the whole poem and then at the end the writer turns and talks to himself or about himself. And that's a wonderful idea. And, uh, boy, short a lot of poems. <laughs> oh, I know what we're doing. You're going to do the oyster plan, 331. Okay. 
Hey, what? The 331. I think that's supposed to be. No one grumbles. Ah, yeah. Wanting sumptuous heavens. No one grumbles among the oyster clans. And lobsters play their bone guitars all summer. <laughs> No one grumbles among the oyster clans, and lobsters play their bone guitars all summer. Only we, without our, with our opposable thumbs, want heaven to be and God to come again. There's no end to our grumbling. We want comfortable earth and sumptuous heaven. But the heron, standing in one leg in the bog, Drinks his dark rum all day and is content. <laughs> Should I do it again? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No one grumbles among the oyster clans, and lobsters play their bone guitars all summer. Only we, with our opposable thumbs, want heaven to be and God to come again. There's no end to our grumbling. We want comfortable earth and sumptuous heaven. But the heron, standing in one leg in the bog, drinks his dark rum all day and is content. Now I'll do it, this is an um poem. Sometimes you, you do a hold of poem together with certain sounds. In this case, I took only one, um. No one grumbles among the oyster clams, and lobsters play their bone guitars all summer. Only we, with our opposable thumbs, want heaven to be and God to come. Again, there's no end to our grumbling. We want comfortable earth and sumptuous heaven. But the heron, standing on one leg in the bog, drinks his dark rum all day and is content. <laughs> all right, now what? Okay, now we can go to the next page. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Blessings now on all who bend their heads. Didn't Joseph bend his head low to kiss the baker's feet? Isn't that the story in the Old Testament? And Joseph is there, and how did the baker get in there? What? The house fly. Okay. The muskrat gives up his father's house, and the house fly bends his head down and gives up his elegant heaven to live with us. <laughs> Do that again. The blessings now on all who bend their heads. Didn't Joseph bend his head low to kiss the baker's feet? The muskrat gives up his father's house, and the house fly bends his head down and gives up his elegant heaven to live with us. Okay, well, good or bad, it's finished. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do the last poem in the book, okay. 364. It's not too worried. Six more drinks would be good. <laughs> <laughs> and this is an old form that the Muslims used a great deal, in which you have a, a single phrase and you repeat it at the end of every stanza. So this is not for beginners, but sort of fun. Don't worry, friends. This night of drinking will not keep you from your wedding. Each of us has been sent out, as Hafez has said, naked on the roads. What does that mean? <laughs> I don't know, that was weird. <laughs> You've been putting sumptuous images in poems for years, hoping they will keep you warm, but they don't. You're still naked on the roads. 
People used to believe that only the heavy drinkers were badly dressed. Now all of us are wandering around naked on the roads. <laughs> you maybe notice that. Some of our old teachers used to wear a vest with gold chains and watch fobs. Now look at them. All of them are naked on the roads. The wild Italians like St. Francis had a sense of it. Take a year off, get rid of your clothes, pick up a stick and go naked on the roads. Of course, St. Francis wasn't, didn't live in Minnesota. <laughs> the wild Italians like St. Francis had a sense of it. If you live in Italy, take a year off, get rid of your clothes, pick up a stick and go naked on the roads. Otherwise, just sit in your goddamn house and shut up. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to fail and be stupid. <laughs> and they say, why would you carry this too far? <laughs> Sometimes it's good to fail and be stupid. If Hafez hadn't been stupid, he wouldn't have the joy of being naked on the roads. Mm. All right, is that it? I think there's I'm one more I'm disappointed, on that list. I want more. I think there's one more on the list, but okay. I suppose you could do anything you want to. Uh, stealing sugar, 316. Okay. Now, I want you to say something to me before we do the last one. What do you think? Did this make sense to you tonight? Yeah. Was it good just to sit there and listen to some guy shooting it off his mouth? <laughs> Trying to Trying to convince you that all these moments are he experiences every day. And, well, anyway. Stealing sugar from the castle. That's the title of them, Stealing Sugar from the Castle. <laughs> we are poor students who stay after school to study joy. We are like those birds in the Indian mountains. I'm a widow whose child is her only joy. The only thing I hold in my ant-like head is the builder's plan of the castle of sugar. Just to steal one grain of sugar is a joy. So this is sort of the opposite of free verse, in which you got so many uh, words and so many, every sentence has to end the same word. Like a bird we fly the darkness into the hall. That's from Beowulf, isn't it? What is human life like? Well, it's like a bird that flies in and down and there he sees all these people having fun, drinking and laughing and, and then he flies out into the night again. That's what human life is like. That's how long it is. <sighs> like a bird we fly out of darkness into the hall which is lit with singing and then we fly out again. Being shut out of the warm hall is also a joy. I'm a laggard, a loafer, and an idiot. But I, my kids say, amen. But I love to read about those who caught one glimpse of the face and died 20 years later in joy. I don't mind you saying I will die soon. People say, aren't you gonna die pretty soon, Robert? You're kinda of old, aren't you? I don't mind you saying I will die soon, even in the word of the sound, sound of the word soon. I hear the word you, which is, which begins every sentence of joy. Ah, you're a thief, the judge said. Let's see your hands. I showed my calloused hands in court. My sentence was a thousand years of joy. All right, so what can you do? Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.
Makes an old Norwegian feel good, all that clapping. <laughs> the streets I, don't clap at all, you know. <laughs> I think we are all very lucky to have spent the last hour listening to poems. Thank you, Mr. Thank Bly. You. Thank you, Thomas Smith. Thank you, Ruth Bly. Thank you, Michael Dennis Brown, uh, for this evening. I also want to thank, again, our friends and sponsors, the Literary Witnesses of Plymouth Congreg Congregational Church, the Loft Literary R Center, Rain Taxi Review of Books, and the Friends of the Library. We have a, a wonderful reception outside. Uh, Mr. Bly will be signing books. Uh, please join us. Thank you for coming. Thank you.